Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Andreas Roos. He's a researcher and activist working to understand, expose, and challenge the environmentally destructive logic of industrial technologies. He recently defended his dissertation in the field of human ecology at Lund University, Sweden, entitled Renewing Power, Including Global Asymmetries Within the System Boundaries of Photovoltaic Technology. The book deals with the mismatch between the conventional expectations of solar technology and the not-so-promising ecological reality of massively increasing the world's solar capacity. He's also done research on the promises and perils of information and communications technologies and compared energy flows in industrial versus non-industrial food systems. First, So first off, thank you for your work in the world. And second, thank you for being on the program. Thank you so much. Thanks, you. Um, so there's a sentence that I just I just read that I, I think is really ex- extraordinary. And in fact, I think your entire uh, dissertation is extraordinary. and People should read it. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, it's called Renewing Power, Including Global Asymmetries Within the System Boundaries of Solar, Vol- Solar Photovoltaic Technology. And you said the book deals with the mismatch between the conventional expectations of solar technology and the not so promising ecological reality of massively increasing the world's solar capacity. What do you mean by that? Well, um, first off, I think uh, it's important to to uh, acknowledge and realize that there is um, a big f- faith in solar technology in in modern societies and, and in industrial culture. Um, and this is um, what I call a a solar vision, basically. Um, that we live with, that, that we live with, essentially. Um, and it's uh, solar power. If you look at any textbook, at least, okay, okay. So wind, wind back. At least when I was a, a student uh, in human ecology, and I read these these books uh, by, for instance, Miller and Spoolman, this living in environment, and these classic textbooks on ecology. Um, we, we all learn about the problems of, of uh, the loss of uh, bi- biodiversity, uh, the impacts of climate change, the detrimental effects of pollution and eutrophication, etc. And then by the end of it, end of the books, uh, almost all of them uh, ends with this kind of hopeful note on uh, renewables. So somehow all these problems uh, will be solved uh, with the help of further technology technology um, that originally generated these problems well solar power may not have generated all of these these problems um, but all of the problems had something to do with the proliferation of modern industrial technology um, and in particular solar power well, so when I wrote this thesis, I was considering writing about all of all renewables, um, but I chose solar power because there is this, um, and I, I can't necessarily explain why, but there is a a, a a fascination for directly capturing uh, the the um, the direct solar energy. Um, and you can see, for instance, there is this proposal, or there was this proposal in this um, textbook that I mentioned, the ecological textbook, uh, where they say that we should increase solar power 700-fold, um, and the, which was more than other renewables. Um, so there is there is an expectation on that renewables, and in solar power in particular, uh, will solve uh, the questions we're facing. So that is the, the vision, essentially. And there are a lot of, of course, arguments, um, some legitimate, like, for instance, uh, solar power generate less um, CO2 emissions uh, in the usage phase, for instance, than fossil fuels. Uh, so they are preferable in some aspects. Um, but it's important to realize that there is there is these technologies do not come from nowhere. Uh, that's what I tried to stress in this uh, thesis, because when we talk about solar power, there is a, there's a tendency 
and any technology for that matter, there is a tendency to omit uh, the fact that they have actually been produced in the world. And um, this is, in a way, the reality. Um, every technology is produced, but in the way we speak about technology, that is typically not recognized. So um, in the thesis, I, I look at these visions and, um, for instance, how solar power can inaugurate new social and ecological relations, um, but find that um, all of these, or most of them, most of these visions tend to just simply ignore that solar power and solar photovoltaic technology in particular is actually being produced. And if we recognize that solar power is being produced, that it has a, a past before appearing to us in the present as artifacts or objects, um, then um, some of these visions become very, very contradictory. So for instance, um, we could say that, um, well, Noam Klein has got these uh, arguments that, you know, we can uh, install or, um, yeah, solar power in our local communities um, in order to, to create a situation where we ourselves uh, organize to produce our own energy, essentially. Uh, but what is omitted from that picture is the fact that solar panels don't simply appear from nowhere. Um, solar panels are produced in a highly complex world economy. Um, and they involve uh, all, all kinds of um, uh, chains in the supply chain. So everything from mining of the raw materials and metals and um, um, silicone, the quartz, um, and silver, zinc, um, all, all kinds of uh, um, metals and rare earth uh, minerals, um, which have an impact upon the natural world and upon the, 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 the systems and social systems, the social conditions of the people living there. And so if we think that um, installing solar power in our local communities will ina somehow inaugurate a just world, an ecologically sustainable world, that vision is contingent. It, it depends on us omitting this whole production chain. And that's the repeated thing that occurs in these visions, um, this omission, essentially. So um, that was a long answer. Um, but that's what I that's so that's the mismatch um, that, that that I have found. And then I, I go in on this is, of course, a theme in, in, in much of um, the ecological critique of renewable energy. So it's, in that sense, it's, uh, it's nothing new. But I dwell into this this issue, uh, you might say, in the thesis and uh, I look at whether this mismatch is actually necessary for solar power um, to, um, to exist in its industrial variety. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by the last thing you said? You, you look into whether this mismatch is necessary. Um, can you be really specific on what mismatch and what you mean by necessary? Okay. <clears throat> so, So the mismatch, mismatch is uh, that our visions, uh, our understanding of solar power does not uh, align to the reality of it. And sorry, yeah. So okay, okay, that 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 you've 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 hit. I, I really like what you've said about that so far. And and what do you mean by necessary? Um, yeah, well, necessary, necessary for what? Um. Necessary in order to get the to get the environmental movement to support the the solar panels, or necessary for governments to support it, or or am I missing your point entirely? Uh, no, necessary for for it to appear as a viable option. 
you might say. Yeah, as, as for it to appear sustainable, you might say. Okay, so can you, I, I think, I really like what you're saying, and this is something that has confounded me and confused me for a long time too, is that you have a lot of people who are explicitly like anti-colonial, and they talk mm -hmm. about being against empire, and they talk about being mm -hmm. sustainable, all three of those things, but um, you know the raw materials will come from Indonesia or from China or from a rural area. So I mean, it, it is it ends up being still colonialism. It's it's I I'm just agreeing with you and, and saying that this confuses me too. Mm. Yeah. Um, so can you go into some of the specifics in the chain of supply? Let's start. Let's 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 move for the next little bit in the interview from let's start with the problems with attaining raw materials through the production and then through uh, land use because you have. Uh, one chapter called Calculating the Necessary Land for the Solar Aspirations of China, excuse me, China, Germany, India, and Italy. Um, so can we can we just move from beginning to end over the next little bit from, from mining materials through land use for it to um, uh, getting rid of the waste materials? Uh, sure. Um, I haven't got into waste material that much, um, but let, we can do that. And I think to start off, um, I think it's first of all very important to recognize how complex these supply chains are. Um, I have one image in the thesis, which is from a, a, a German company called uh, Nagel Ite, which um, produces one single commodity, and I'll just mention it because it's relevant in this context. Um, and it's it's a computer mouse. It's one of those computer mouse with a cord. Um, uh, just looks completely ordinary computer mouse. And the whole company idea is to be able to track each of the material components down to the to the metals in the in the world and where they come from, and document. Um, whether or not these uh, chains, these ma materials that are produced for the mouse, uh, are produced under fair conditions or not. And they have this great PDF um, illustration, essentially, where they, um, they, they display it as boxes that are either red or green. And uh, if they're green, they're, they're, they can... They know about the working conditions and they're fair, etc. If they're if they're red, they don't know anything about it. Um, and when you look at that picture, um, there are hundred one hundred and forty, or actually one hundred thirty nine chains boxes um, for one single computer mouse. So to produce something as seemingly simple as a little computer mouse, uh, there are over a hundred steps involved in its production, and so I think we should bear this in mind first and foremost when we talk wait, about. It. Wait, mm. I, I'm looking. I'm looking at the chart right now. And do you mm. mean a hundred steps, or do you mean a hundred uh, materials? Um, well, so there are a hundred different processes, I would say. Okay. So there, there are roughly uh, I don't know how many materials. Twenty to thirty materials, maybe. Okay. And then these are processed um, in many, many different steps um, to finally arrive at the, the computer mouse. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's it's um, um, notoriously difficult to trace all of the the material components in a solar panel, but we know about the, uh, and it's relatively easy to find the. Um, the most obvious um, material components of it, such as um, quartz and polysilicone, um, that is making up the most obvious part of the solar 
module or so a panel. So, um, so by the way, uh, by, hmm. by the way, um, as we speak right now, as we're doing this interview, there is a terrible fire going on at a polysilicon plant in China. Oh, is there? Yeah, yeah. I just read about it today. Wow. Do you know where it is? Um. Um. Was it reported in? Uh, would you know where it was reported? Um. Keep talk. Okay, I know this is mm. really rude, but keep talking, and I'll look it up and tell you in a second. Okay, sure. Um. Yeah, and I think you in your book you go through you go through these um, steps of the supply chain in a way better than I do. Um. um uh, but what I look what I look at is the the total um, and uh, carbon footprint and ecological footprint, not only carbon footprint, of the entire commodity chain of solar panels. So I, in a way, do a, a shortcut where I don't go into the polysilicon production and then estimate the land necessary for that uh, alone. But I take energy, uh, sorry, money as a, as a measure. Um, um, so the money that has that these um, uh, solar modules, the, the costs of them essentially, and I translate that costs into uh, land, um, which is a is a method I use in chapter five, which I I don't think I will explain it now, but um, it's it's a two step method. Um, that is connected to to um, work in ecological economics. Where you first, okay, maybe I should just say very very briefly um, how I do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, so for the first step essentially is is to convert money to energy, and we know there's ecological economics uh, who work with these these issues. They know there's a very um, close link between a country's energy use um, or energy um, uh, dissipation, you might say, because energy cannot actually be used up, um, and um, it's GDP. So if, if uh, GDP goes up, you can be pretty sure that the energy expenditure will follow the exact same curve. Um, if it goes down, you will could expect the energy usage is going down as well. And uh, of course, in physics, uh, all of the all verbs essentially price energy. So every economic activity is energy that is being dissipated or transformed or used, if you will. Um, so there's a very close relation between GDP, money, and energy use in that sense. The second step is to to uh, convert this um, energy use, if, if money is a representative of energy, to land. And here the best way is to go through the carbon footprint, which is what I, what I did. Um, um, where a certain amount of energy, a fossil en energy in particular, is connected to a particular uh, ecological footprint. So that... To, um, that we can so we can derive a land estimate from that, which which includes also the the sequestration of the carbon um, through reforestation, um, and I mean there are all kinds of questions we can go into here, but I, I I'll just leave it at that. So so I I, I do a shortcut for these um, this commodity chain here and arrive at how much land essentially. A, a solar panel requires um, uh, and how much energy it requires in order to um, to exist you might say in order to be produced and uh, if we include the entire commodity chain um, well so if you look at it if you look at a solar panel as an object you can see that you know there's a certain amount of area that it covers uh, to capture the sun and um, the area that is necessary apart from this immediate surface area that you see is um, 
up to or higher than a, a hundred times more of that. So, so if the, you have a if you have a solar panel that is just for the sake of ease is one meter by one meter, then that yeah. means that you would that actually harmed land that was a hundred square meters. Yes, exa exactly. More, more than that. Um, but these calculations are also, uh, they're not um, extremely accurate. Um, so, uh, but more, a hundred is, is uh, we can say with relative certainty, um, but more, uh, I would say. I got actually, um, my figures point to 80 to 160 times. Uh, but just to be on the safe side, I say 100. And um, you mentioned energy. Do you want to talk about what you just do you want to talk about what you're talking about more or do you want I, I would love if you would introduce EROI and talk about the EROI um, of of solar as well. But but do you want to talk more about what you're doing before you go there or do you want to jump into EROI? I think I can I can um, explain one more thing about this with land <clears throat> and then um, how it's relevant for for. Uh, for our understanding of, of uh, solar power as authoritarian. Okay, great, please. And, and then I can jump into EROI uh, or EROI. Um, well, so, so if, if this is true or to, uh, that solar panels actually uh, necessitate this amount of land, um, then um, the question in a sense becomes, Okay, so if we are have these local communities um, and or a nation for that matter, and we have an aspiration, a, a vision to transform our current way of living uh, with uh, the energy consumption, I'm talking about we in the industrial nations, uh, Western world, um, transform our energy way high energy way of living. Um, into uh, from from fossil fuels to these solar panels, for instance, or renewable other renewables. Um, what would that demand of the natural world? Um, and could you, as a local community, even feasibly have the whole production chain within your uh, local community? Would it even be possible? Would there be enough space, essentially? To, uh, to kind of compress this whole commodity chain, just in theory. Wait, so I've, you're you're not even suggesting that they have to have all the raw materials there, which will never happen because you're not going to have, I don't know, silver everywhere. You're not going to have copper everywhere. You're not going to have um, the right quality of of quartz everywhere. So you're not you're just saying land. You're not saying specific materials, right? Yeah, in this case, yes. So this is a this is a thought experiment, you might say. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because because of course with if if you have to include the, the specific raw materials, then it's even more absurd. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole idea of of locally producing energy with solar power is is if you look at it this way, it's ridiculous. Like no no local area has got all these materials in one particular space place. Um so it's not a matter of uh, producing uh, and like solar. That's that's the thing as well. The, the whole production chain is often omitted in the way we talk about solar power. So when we say local energy production, we, we're not including the whole commodity chain of the solar models. Um, and yeah, that would be um, unfeasible to begin with because we don't have all the materials in one place. Yeah. But, but I interrupted you when you were saying about land. Yeah. So even if, if we have, a, say, a country that has a – this is what I go into in Chapter 5. Even if we have a country such as uh, Germany, for instance, um, who has had and has um, uh, high-flying visions of a um, solar-powered future, renewables-powered future, would there be uh, enough land – to um, to accommodate this whole um, production process um, without compromising um, 
too much, you might say, or anything. Now, well, it would compromise uh, um, local environments for sure, but how much? Um, and um, what I find is that if you, so that would obviously depend on the vision and how much energy you would you would uh, expect to produce. Um, and what I find, uh, along with other uh, researchers in this area, um, is that sometimes these visions would demand more surface area than the entire country uh, can provide, um, which means, and, and what I what I claim in the thesis is that this does not necessarily mean that solar power is. Um, um, impossible um, for for countries such as Germany, even if it has this massive um, ecological footprint. Um, but it means that if you can outsource this land requirement, um, then you can have solar power uh, as a as a feasible, you might say, at least locally, option for your country. Or your local community. So, um, so that's where I claim that these visions uh, and solar PV, large-scale solar PV uh, projects, are inherently political in the sense that they would they would be very unattractive if you would not outsource the impacts uh, of them. And um, that's what also makes them authoritarian in Mumford's sense, that they require, in a sense, uh, global asymmetries um, or asymmetries between people. And, um, um, and that is that is the, what I found in the, in the thesis overall, you might say. So that's a, in a way a short summary there. Um, and the same goes for energy. Um, so there is this measure on EROI, um, which stands for energy return on energy invested. Sometimes it's abbreviated E-R-O-E, um, let's see, EROI, so energy return on energy invested. Um, sorry, did you want to say something before I jump into this? Oh, I was just going to read something from your thesis, sure. um, which is saying exactly what you're saying. This finding, these, these findings imply that Germany's solar aspirations would probably imply high economic costs if the energy, land, and labor had to be supplied domestically. The possibility can be tested by calculating the cost of solar PV modules based on German wages and energy prices. And in the 2018, China exported solar PV modules to Germany at a total exchange value of 463 million US dollars and there were X amount of labor and you just go through and um, if they were paid German wages instead of Chinese wages it would have been 1.4 million dollars um, and then embodied the energy you go through the same thing there it's just again a lot of the people who promote this also claim to be for social justice but it's it's based on as you said unfair labor practices right and and very different forms of environmental regulations uh, if you compare germany to china for instance yeah oh exactly one of the reasons that the prices are so much cheaper in china is because they don't have the regulations for what to do with the waste materials yeah yeah exactly yeah, it's, I think that this is what is completely missed when when people are praising the low costs of solar panels. Um, like I, I go through some of the explanations of of why we see the reduction in price on solar panels and the kind of drastic drop over the ten last ten fifteen years. And there is there are a lot of people thinking that it's it's because of increased um, that we just become better at producing them uh, in the sense that we have increased our scientific knowledge of the photovoltaic process and engineering practices, but completely missed this um, point that the production has been moved from uh, North America and Europe to Asia, uh, where there are much lower wages and uh, less environmental regulations, 
which is why also we see this uh, these massive um, uh, impacts of the solar industry and, and pollution of rivers, um, the essential killing of landscapes, um, and these these other reports that we we get. And now more recently, I think just a few days before my defense, there was this uh, reports from the Guardian on the that the Uyghurs, um, so this um, um, ethnic mi minority and and people in in the northwest of China in the, in the Xinjiang province are basic who who are basically shuttled into these uh, labor camps uh, are actually the the working the workers in the for the solar modules and there was this uh, I don't know headline where it was uh, I can't remember the headline now but this a scandal that 40% of the UK of UK's solar panels were produced by these U Uyghurs, and uh, so it's not about increased knowledge of this photovoltaic process. Um, it's um, that has reduced these prices. It's not that they become more efficient and therefore cheaper, etc. Uh, it's because uh, essentially it's easier, or they've learned uh, these corporations to exploit and governments for that matter. Um, people and environments by moving production facilities. And um, what we see in turn as well is that um, production facilities are also moving from China to Southeast Asia now. Uh, so to Malaysia, Vietnam uh, and other, other, other places. Um, so the, these production facilities move around where the environmental regulations are low and where the labor is cheap. That's what transnational uh, corporations do. That's their, um, in a way, one of the roots of their, their power, you might say. So, so three things. One of them is that one of the things I love about your thesis and about this conversation is I, I really... Um, I really love this sort of analysis and this sort of honesty and uh, just sort of a hard look at, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about solar photovoltaics or or where your dinner came from or or anything else. I, I, I love this sort of precise analysis. So I just want to really thank you for that. Um, second thing is... I said earlier I was going to look up the uh, the massive fire. You said where is it? And mm. I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, but it's S H I H E Z I city in X Y N J I A N G in China. Okay, you said last one X Y N X Y X I N J I A N G Xinjiang. Xinjiang, yeah, that's the province I was talking about with the the Uyghurs, I, I suspect. Um, Xinjiang, yeah. Ex it's a big explosion happened, a massive fire and explosion at a polysilicon chemical plant in that city in that that province. Mm. Uh, June eighth around noon. <clears throat> okay. Any anyway, so third thing. Now that I've interrupted you so many times, uh, do you want to talk about EROEI? Uh, I can briefly mention it, um, yeah, and, and some of and the, then, its relation to... Yeah, and its relation to solar. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so ERI stands for the Energy Return on Energy Investment. So it's different from... from you, you, yeah, it's a, it's a concept that's used by uh, ecological economists, um, which is the field I'm drawing upon in this thesis, apart from philosophy of technology. Um, and essentially it is... Okay, so for any, any organism to survive in nature, you need to acquire energy in some, some way or another, one way or another. Um, and for most species, that is simply uh, eating food. So hunting, gathering uh, food, the food that you need, foraging. Um, um, and the same applies to humans and human societies. We need food. And um, we also need, uh, uh, or we don't necessarily need, but we often make use of um, 
energy, even if it's not food. So for heating our homes, for instance. Um, um, okay, so, so, but all of these strategies to get energy requires energy as well. So say oil, just take an example like oil. We, uh, there needs to be an ex actual excavation and production of oil to receive oil. In that way, you use energy in order to get energy. Um, and the EROI of, so energy return on energy investment is the ratio between how much you use and how much you get uh, from a particular energy strategy, you might say, or energy technology. So as an example, the um, uh, early oil fields in the spindle top, um, for instance, in, I think, Texas. Uh, yeah, I can't exactly remember. But um, the energy return on energy investment was extremely high. You basically drilled down a few meters. And, you know, these these classic images of oil just spewing up. And there's like this oil rain. Uh, I don't know how, how much that is cartoon and how much that is reality. But um, you essentially drilled a hole. Um, um, which didn't require that much energy to do to get a massive amount of energy. So the EROI of early oil, uh, you might say early conventional oil was extremely high. So something in the lines of for one unit of energy, you got maybe a hundred units back or more. And uh, you can apply this to all kinds of energy strategies. You can apply it to uh, hunter gathering, how much, Energy are is hunter gatherers in certain areas uh, using versus how much they get back from that practice. Um, so um, and one of the yeah so the same applies to solar panels of course um, um, that you need to use energy you need to manufacture solar panels in order for solar panels to be installed. Sorry, and then um, then um, actually generating or harnessing uh, the energy. And the EROI of of solar panels is uh, disputed, you might say, because there are and and other energy technologies too, for that matter. But especially solar power, power and biomass are disputed because it, there's this conversation of what should you actually include in the production process. Um, and in the thesis, what I do is that I show that the more we include um, or the, the, the wider we draw the boundaries of what a solar panel is. So if we include the entire commodity chain, like I talked about before, uh, then we get a very uh, non-favorable view from an energy point of view. Wait, so the, before we yeah, go any further... Why? What would be a what would be a an argument for not being inclusive? Why Why would you not include all of the energy inputs? Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. Um, well, so um, I mean, because you do the analysis, you may as well do the analysis. Right. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Um, one. One reason that I found is that um, um, some researchers claim that this is not interesting for policymakers uh, because, um, and I don't know why. Um, um, okay, just to be yeah. just to be clear, let's say some place is going to mine a hundred tons of quartz and that's going to cost a certain amount of units. Well, I understand that if some of that quartz goes into, I don't know, windows or some other use, then obviously you don't count that in the solar panels. No. But if 20% of the quartz goes into solar panels, then you can count 20% of the energy that went into mining the quartz. Mm. Right? Yeah. I mean, that, that just makes sense. I mean, I, yes. I don't know why you would exclude anything. Sorry. Sorry that my yeah. voice is getting thin and reedy and I'm getting defensive, but this this is annoying. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think um, 
but this is where 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 it's where it's at in a way. I, I my claim is that this these narrow boundaries where they don't include the parts of the production chain at all. Um, okay, so one of, of the arguments that I know now is that um, some researchers, not all, want to have a clearly defined boundary so you can compare different energy technologies. Say like yeah, so kind of to systemize systemize it somehow. Um, and it, because if you include the entire production chain, it becomes more messy in a way, but it also becomes more representative of reality. And that's what my claim, at least, is in this chapter, that if we include more of the, the, the entire production chain, if we don't do that, we won't get a complete picture of what solar power is and what it does and what it requires. Okay, uh, so but this wait. is not interesting for everyone. Um, uh, these other people who who simply wants to compare it to solar power, uh, compare solar power to fossil fuels, and be able to say let's do f solar power instead of fossil fuels. That's like there's this research that it kind of just wants to compare with fossil fuels, and then uh, to be able to say let's go with solar power, kind of. Yeah. Okay, I I just thought of an argument for why you should set a boundary. So that Let's say you are mining the 100 tons of, 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 of quartz, and obviously it takes more than 100 tons. You do 100 tons at some mine. So do you then have to include the, uh, the, the trucks that are used in mining? Do you have to include all of those? And what if they bought a used truck? Do you have, how do you prorate that? So I do see how it could get complicated. Mm. Yeah, right. And 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 how much energy is used in the production of that truck in turn. And right. And like I said, if it's a used truck you buy, how much of it do you have do you have to count in the solar and how much of it for its previous job as a dump truck? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot it's, it involves a lot of assumptions. Um but you can also yeah. Um you can okay. also get the uh, pretty fair um, uh, um, estimations of how much energy would be required. Um, but yeah, it all depends on your, the assumptions you're making. Uh, okay, unless you so actually go to a place and, and, and track the whole thing, which is, again, immensely complex. Well, and then how much of the food for the miners do you count? I mean, I, I can see how yeah. it could get impossibly complex in an impossibly complex world. Okay, so mm -hmm. so now that I've muddied all those waters. Um, can you sort of give us the bottom line on on EROI for uh, for for solar? Yeah. Okay. So um, before I do that, let me just um, give you a brief idea of what the actual numbers mean. So there is a something called the net energy cliff, which explains how a higher EROI um, um, relates to the percentage of okay no so this becomes more uh, way too technical I think um, we'll get, let's just say like an EROI up until 10 so if you use uh, one unit of energy you get 10 units back that's quite favorable for society um, or quite unfavorable to society um, um, but and then when it gets higher than 10, it's it's a, it's a decent energy strategy for sustaining advanced industrial societies, you might say. Um, and this, of course, doesn't in, take into account the qualitative difference between electricity and, and uh, uh, fuels and etc. Um, so an energy, so for example, an EROI of two uh, would demand that 50% of society's energy is dedicated entirely to this energy strategy. So if you have a solar power, uh, solar power, and the EROI is, is um, what we say uh, two to one, so you use one unit of energy and you get two units back, uh, that means that 50% of society's whole effort, all energy use, uh, would be uh, used for the, for the production of solar panels. So that's a massive amount of energy. And then I have three different boundaries. And the conventional boundary, EROI standard, that gets the figure of 7.7 .7 to 
38. So almost up to 40 eRoy, which is which means that if we include a lot of exclude a lot of the production process, these solar panels appear as uh, very um, energy favorable. You can and the the, the conclusion would be yes, we can sustain in that, uh, advanced industrial societies on these technologies. Um, there's a middle boundary that ends at uh, roughly four, uh, which includes also. Um, yeah, like we talked before, it includes more of these, uh, the energy. Um, um, and I, I, I go into exactly how, what these boundaries are in more in detail in thesis. And then we have the ERO extended, where I try to include, this is what I do here, I try to include the entire production process as much as I can. And I end up with an ERO of 0 0.8 to uh, maximum of four um, for solar power. So for an eroy of four, if I'm generous, um, that would mean that any any society that wants to sustain on 100% solar power, just as a thought experiment now, uh, there's actually no such society, but there is of efforts to push for 100% renewables. Um, but four would require um, at least uh, 60 to 70 percent, sorry, uh, 40, 30 to 40 percent of society's entire energy use. Um, and energy use and energy expenditure is everything we do. So when you wake up in the morning, say, uh, you need to spend a third of your time uh, to the development of solar power, you might say. Everything, 30% or 40% of everything that, that happens in society uh, would be have to be designated to the production of these energy technologies. So in that sense, um, uh, and from there you can again say that if you can export or outsource um, certain amount of this energy requirement, the ERO go, go, goes up. So they become more and en en energetically favorable if other people can do this, you know. Um, and that's what happens essentially. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm not sure if, uh, if that was too convoluted, maybe. No, 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 no. I, yeah. I think this is incredibly important stuff. Um, mm. So we're we're down to just a few minutes left, and um, and can you can you uh, sum up for us what you would like for listeners of this interview to take away. What what what's your point? What are you trying yeah. to, to say? And it, you can go on for a few minutes. You don't have to do it in one sentence or anything. Mm. Well, um, Yeah, there, was, there are many points to make uh, with regards to solar power. Um, well, one thing we what, haven't talked about is we haven't talked about your larger analysis. You know, we've only talked about solar, which is fine if you want to stay there. But if you want to jump to a larger analysis of technology, you can do that, too. Whatever you want to do is great. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to, wrap, how, how to wrap up or how to do um how, how to like uh, yeah wrap up um i think um yeah there are many many ways i can do this i suppose um well one of the major findings or like major points that i i'd like to come across um that stems from another analysis as well, but th that is um, that if we pursue solar power as societies um, to prevent climate change, um, then we should expect significant and increased social ecological problems in other parts of the, the Earth system. So solar power does not come from nowhere. I think that's the, the essential message but it's often displayed as if this just simply it's pops out of the ground 
or not even that. It just pops out of thin air. And that's, that's an illusion um, and an overlooked um, flaw in the modern cultural uh, conception of the world. Technologies do not come from nowhere. And the same applies for, for a car and, 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 and anything else. Um, so, and solar power in particular, um, and renewables, um, if they are to sustain our current way of living, uh, or rather if we want to sustain our way of living through the help of renewables, it will require a massive amount of materials. I think this is uh, an, a massive impact on the natural world that may may even exceed the problems uh, and the impacts of climate change, for instance. Um, and so essentially this means that we need to seriously question uh, industrial industrialism, essentially, which is the dedication, the blind dedication, you might say, at least today, to mass production of commodities and mass uh, consumption. Um, I mean, this has to go, essentially, uh, if we want to maintain any form of relation to the to the Earth and the Earth system, uh, which is, then our relation is our survival, of course. Um, um, now, there is a power dimension in this too, which is that certain groups of people can actually maintain solar power and have solar power and renewables if they manage, if they can export the impacts of them. And in that sense, um, large scale solar PV development and other renewables um, has an inherent colonial character to them. Um, and this colonialism, of course, extends, it's not only social, but also ecological. So what we're doing when we turn to renewables is that we're not uh, to sustain our way of living uh, or the way of living, not our, uh, the industrial way of living. Um, is that we're essentially not renewing energy, but we're renewing the, the, the domination of the natural world. Uh, and we're renewing the social power structure that has shaped the world economy, at least since the 16th century. Um, so it's not something new. Um, renewables is not something new in its essence. It's a continuation of um, industrial capitalism that has wreaked havoc on the planet uh, for way too long. So. Um, yeah, that's why I titled this book Renewing Power, because that's what that's what it does. That's what it is. So I, I suppose that's um, uh, one way to sum up. Uh, just a final point as well, that we're often. So one question is, OK, why, why don't people in general make this argument? Why? Why do we not see this? Uh, why do people tend to? not make this come to the same conclusion, but rather think of solar power as a salvation and a way to uh, fundamentally transform society and our nature relations. And one concept that we haven't talked about is uh, fetishiza uh, fetishization, which is essentially uh, an anthropological concept explaining how uh, modern humans, um, in particular, uh, that people within the industrial culture societies, um, tend to ascribe agency to technological artifacts in their everyday life and uh, think of technological artifacts. So you might have a cell phone or a computer in front of you uh, as an independent object, as an object that just simply exists. Um, with a production productive capacity of its own. It's we say in our language, it's the computer that does the work or the phone that does the work or the solar panel that captures the energy. Uh, but this cannot happen without these supply chains. Uh, but they are typically uh, hidden from our view, uh, from
for us as consumers of them at least. Um, so, so we're inhibited from understanding real impacts and the real uh, the reality of technologies. Uh, we're not encouraged to think of the computer as a um, um, as having or as solar panels having this very complicated past. And um, so we don't make this. Um, so we just look at the solar panel, or some people just look at the solar panel and say, "Okay, yeah, let's install this here, and it will be, it will solve issues." Uh, and the solar panel has then just appeared out of thin air. Um, um, yeah. So I, I suppose I'll, I'll I'll just end there, I guess. Um, well, okay. I would like to. I would like to read one sentence from your from your wonderful piece, and then we'll close. And the, the sentence is, this forces us to con seriously consider to what degree a long-term sustainable relation to the biosphere can be reached through an endless expansion of the technosphere, as, it, as implied in proposals for green, in quotes, growth, or various green, in quotes, technologies, and to what degree it can only be reached by a progressive degrowth with attention to well-being, justice and ecological limits. So I really want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you for your your work in the world. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. And my guest today has been Andreas Roos. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.